Let me give you one final example. How many, raise your hand if you have kids in the room. Okay, so a lot of you have kids. So why, I use this example a lot, and it's going to go in a second into, um, I'm going to talk about connection and empathy, but here's what. I want you to imagine your kids being bullied at school. And if your kid is being bullied at school, they come home and he or she is crying. Um, a lot of parents, and it's especially men because of how their brain is wired, but it's women too. What are you kind of hardwired to do in that moment? Your kid's upset, crying. What do you want to do? You said kill the other person? Okay. <laughs> Not that kind of workshop, okay? okay? So what happens is a lot of times we want to fix it, right? We want to fix people. We want to say, well, then this is what you're going to do. We're going to go to the school. We're going to call the parents. We're going to do this. And unfortunately, what I tell everyone, people don't need fixing. They need to be heard. People don't need fixing. They just want to be heard. And what happens is so many times we don't let, our, we don't let ourselves be heard. I'm going to show you the next quote. If there was one quote I could teach the rest of my life, it would be this. Oprah said, everyone in life just wants to know three things. That is it. They want to know, do you see me? Do you hear me? And does what I say mean anything to you at all? That is it, everyone, your customers, your kids, your partner, your stranger on the street, everyone in life just wants to know, did you see me? Do you get me? Does what I'm going through mean anything to you? So I'm going to play it back to your kids. Your kid comes home and is crying, is upset on the floor. In that moment, before you try to fix anything, all they want to know is, listen, do you see me? Do you get me? Does what I'm going through mean something? And when we try to fix them and take care of the situation, what do we do with everything that they're feeling emotionally, we completely dismiss it and we teach them to fix themselves versus to feel themselves and to work through the feelings. And we know you're not going to, you can't get through anything until you learn to sit in the mess. And so what happens is they stop feeling and they just start going on. And then um, there's a quote in the country. I don't know who said this, but I love it. It says, we all get addicted to the thing that takes away our pain everyone. We all get addicted to the thing that takes away our pain. And so what happens is when kids don't feel whole or they lack self-confidence or they don't have an outlet to really express themselves in a safe environment, they will find an environment or an outlet that validates them. So if they post provocative photos on social media and they get hundreds of likes, what do they do? That feels good. And so they keep doing it because that's the space where they get validation. And so our presence has to be a place for them to say, it's okay. So I'm going to give you an example how I would address that situation. In that moment, what do you think your kid needs to hear from you above anything else? Okay, you, you, it sucks and you're loved. So here's an example. Now, this is what I spent hours, like we spent over 300 hours in coaching just practicing the skills and techniques. I'm going to give you one, but it's with body language, but I'm going to give you the vocal part. So this is what I would say to him or her. Just say, of course you're upset. Because you used to be so excited to get out of bed every day, go to school and be with your friends and play and learn, and you loved your teacher, and now you've got to get up every day and you don't even want to go because you're afraid of what this jerk's going to do to you, and you'd rather just not go anymore. And they look up at you and say, exactly. In the moment someone says, yes, what do they tell you? You see me. You get me, and what, what, you're, what I'm saying doesn't, doesn't mean I'm not crazy for feeling the way that I'm feeling. Please do not underestimate this week those nine women around you or however many women around you. They are going through something that they are not going to tell you, and your presence alone just says, woman, I see you. I hear you and what you're going through. You don't even have to tell me, but I'm going to be here, and what you're going through matters to me. Understand the power of your presence, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that at the end and give you one final thing to think about, but I want you to do one thing as a table. I want you to think about a time this week. This table did it perfectly over here a second ago, okay? I want you to think about a time you weren't connecting this week. Think about, it might have just been because you were busy or what else, but really think about a time that you weren't connecting. Maybe it was on a plane, maybe it was here in this room or last night at the networking event with your family. And I want you to think about what got in your way from really connecting with them. And I want you to share at your table. So I'm gonna give you like a minute or two to share that. What was a time you did not connect this week and what prevented you from actually connecting with that person? I'll have you share it. All right, so let's talk about it. So I feel like I've kind of neglected this side. So over here, I want to hear from you. So when you think about, I don't need to know the story about why you didn't connect, but I do want to hear from you um, what prevented you from connecting. What, what got in the way? What would you say? So just, did you say tired? Yeah, sometimes we're just busy and we get exhausted and then we're kind of on, from an energy perspective, we don't have a lot to offer people. What else? What'd you say? Oh, your emails, okay, yeah. So emails, what else over here? My to-do list. Okay, to-do list, yeah. We got stuff we gotta do and check off. What, what is it? So yeah, just not feeling well. And over here, any, any other things that have not been said? 
So, the, did you say the pool? Oh, school. She's like, I got it at the pool, okay? I was like, girl, it's a rough life, okay? Yeah. So school, and you got things going on. You said the environment. What about the environment? Like last night, for instance, um, at, the, at the ball, where everyone was trying to kind of intermingle, it was very hard, I felt, because you act one, you got the music playing loud. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of, it, it takes you back to walk up to like a table full of people who all know each other. Sure. And you're trying to, you know, get to know that whole loud music. Yeah. Happening. Yeah. Kind of disconnection. Yeah. What is going on over there? I love this. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Is somebody presenting over there? Should I know about something? <laughs> is my zipper down? <laughs> Okay, so yeah, so we talk about the environment, especially for sometimes like, you know, on stage, I probably come across extroverted, but I'm very introverted. So after this is over, I want to be alone, like I got to recharge. And sometimes introverted, sometimes, not all the time, it can, it can be intimidating to go into a group of people that you don't know. I hate networking stuff too, right? So how do you sometimes do that? But it's necessary. Doesn't mean you got to like it, it's necessary. And it's also about, what I would also just say is sometimes it's not even about saying anything, it's just being there, right? And just, again, that your presence makes the difference. Hey, I saw you there. I'm glad you attended. And just being able to say that to people. Um, and I think that's another reason why in this event, right, they set you with people you don't know to go, you know what? You have an opportunity to really get some more people and get to know some other, um, other things about other people. So I want to show you this. I'm going to ask for a volunteer in just a second. But I want to show you what it looks like and how empathy and collaboration actually looks different than confidence and power, because it is completely different. So someone over here, I need a brave volunteer just to come up here with me and just um, give, me, okay, give Donna some love. All right. So I'm just going to show you from a couple of things from a body language perspective of how this is going to act. Don't, Donna, sit down. <laughs> All right. So watch what happens. So Donna, face me with your chair. So I'm going to show you a couple of things. So you all know some of this because you've been taught about active listening, all this, but I'm going to show you some of the science. So I don't want you to tell them what you think I want you to say. I want you to tell them what you really believe. All right. So half the room a second ago just said your face and your eyes are the most honest part of the body. So everything I teach is about energy and connection. So watch this. Does this energy, Donna? With, me, with my feet facing this way, but my head facing this way, does this energy feel different than if I actually just show up and actually talk to you like this? I like that better. Yeah. The energy between us feels completely different. And so what happens is, when you think about showing up for people and about active listening, what are some of the things that you've actually been taught? So I just gave you the first one, is I would tell you, always point your feet to people. Because watch what happens. If your boss comes into your office and you're working, you will do one of two things. You're sitting here typing, and you have one of two options options. When your boss comes in, or he or she, you will go, hey, how's it going? And you'll smile and you'll look nice with your face and you might even nod your head, but you don't move your feet. What are you actually doing more focused on? You're more focused on what's going on. And so it doesn't mean it's right or wrong or bad or good, but I know when people don't turn their feet, they're not inviting me in the conversation. I don't have to create a story about it. I trust that whatever they're working on is probably important to them. I'll say, hey, I just want to say hello. I'll catch you later. Because if you really were interested in the conversation, you'd be like, hey, come on in. Let's talk, you know, let's talk, sit down. And you would face them. I did a workshop for a, a, a group of women, and I had a mom come up to me later, and she comes up to me and she goes, thank you. She goes, as a mom, I've gotten so busy being busy. My kids go to school all day, like you said over there. They come home, and I'm helping them with homework, you know, cooking dinner, getting them ready for bed. She goes, I don't even know if I even stop and just face my own kids and just say, how was your day? Because I'm so busy multitasking and busy being busy. How many of you in this room, women, ever read the, um, the article? It went viral from a mom to her daughter called The Day I Stopped Saying Hurry Up. Anyone read that? If you have not, I highly recommend you read that article. It's written from a mom to her daughter, and it was, she said it was the day I stopped saying hurry up. She goes, I started my day with it. Hurry up, get dressed. Hurry up, brush your teeth. Hurry up, get on the bus. I ended my day with it. Hurry up, do your homework. Hurry up, do this. And she goes, I think I'm saying the words hurry up more than I love you. And she saw how her daughter started taking her characteristics and passing them on to her younger daughter. It's a really powerful article. But watch what happens. If I was to slow down from my busyness and show up for Donna, you don't have to show up for everyone in your life. But when you want to show up for people, I want you to know how to use your body language. So you've already said, one thing I would do with Donna is I would point my feet to Donna. What else would I do? Okay. So you, I, I lean in. Now, you all know this, but why do we lean in? What's the perception? Yeah, because we get closer to the things that we like. We get further from the things that we don't like. So imagine this, all right? So Donna, let's, let's face this way. Let's go on the plane ride together, all right? So come on. 
I got that darn middle seat, y'all, all right? So imagine, all right, yeah, she took up the armrest. Of course she did, okay? So imagine, yeah, you got, yeah, you're framing the naughty bits and everything. This is good, Donna. So imagine that um, if I'm on here, I, I know this person, but I don't know Donna. Where will my feet cross over to mostly? Generally, they will cross to the person you know because what I have done now is I've blocked this person. Stranger danger with Donna, right? So what you're doing is I am trying, to, the vulnerable parts of my body are facing the person I'm most comfortable with. Now, if it's a really long trip, you might end up crossing over just because your legs get tired. But generally, I do this crazy thing in the plane that if, if I do want to talk and I can see this person will generally, when you sit down, they will cross the other way as well because you'll actually face away. So if I'm in a conversational mode, I'll be like, so where are you going? And over time, what happens, the moment they feel safe, if they will either uncross their legs and they will start doing this. And I know from a communication perspective, I'm kind of playing this game, but it's like, I got them, right? They would never do that had they not felt safe enough to do that. So part of our job is to be able to show up for people and, and do that. Imagine though, you can tell by the way, uh, relationships, you can tell when it goes well or not. Because if we were on the way to the movies or church or wherever you want to go, right? And Don and I, we're, we're going to date Donna, okay? Okay. This is only a scenario, okay? Okay. So Donna and I are dating. If it's going really well and we're in the... Okay. Okay. If, if Donna and I are... You are a great example. I'm glad you raised your hand. Yeah. If Donna and I are dating and it's going really well in the movie theater, like, how would you sit? We'd be really close. She'd probably be touching. You would do that. But on the way there, if you got into an argument and you just want to rip off the other person's face, you're going to have to sit close together, but you'll know at church and stuff or the movies because they're probably going to be face. They're going to create as much space from them, self as humanly possible. So we know that when we really feel connected with people, we try to, we try to, we, we get closer. We, we close that space. So let's go back to our scenario. All right. So if we were looking at each other and I was talking to her, you're coaching her, sitting down with your partner, having a conversation, it doesn't matter. So you all said I would lean in, I would actually point my feet towards that person so I'm showing up. What else would I do? Eye contact. Okay, eye contact, this is big. Out of 100% eye contact, how much should you maintain out of 100%? Not 100, it's creepy, no one likes it, okay? <laughs> no one likes it, okay? Because, listen, I didn't put the picture on the screen, but I hope this person never sees this video, but I call it Gary Busey creepy. Like, you know, he's like this. Like, yeah, like it's, it's, it's over the top, like too much eye intensity, so it's too intense. Because what happens is this, here's what the research says. If all we do is look at someone 100% of the time and we never look away, what is it actually considered, especially in business? Okay, it's intimidation. And so what happens is if I never look, and some people just don't even have the awareness that they're doing it, right? So, but what happens is if we only look at someone 100% of the time, it, it comes across as intimidation. So the research, you don't need to know the number, but I'm going to give it to you. The research says we should maintain between 60 and 70% consistent eye contact. Anything above 80 is considered intimidation. So watch this. If I'm coaching Donna or I'm talking to Donna, and maybe she's going through something kind of hard, and she maybe even gets emotional, what do you think I do with my eye contact? I actually break eye contact. Why do you all think that I do that? Why do you think in that moment I break eye contact and stop looking at Donna? Yeah. Part of what we have to do as leaders is meet people where they are. And so what I also know is I create space in the conversation for her to feel comfortable and to give her the space that she needs to kind of think through her thoughts and not feel like it's a fire drill. Could you imagine if someone just kept looking at you as you got emotional and be like, here it comes. Like, <laughs> No, like, don't look at me, right? Give me a moment to kind of think and collect myself. So sometimes I'll look down as, she's, as Donna's kind of talking or going through it, and then I'll look back and I'm saying, Donna, I'm really sorry you had to go through that. I didn't know that happened to you. So let's talk about it. And I lower my tone and I meet her where she is, right? There's one other gesture I really want you to know. So on the handout, we talk about collaboration and empathy. I, under, I want you to understand, it's your feet pointing towards someone. It's having between 60 and 70% eye contact. It's leaning in because we get closer to the things we like. There's one other gesture that I, when it comes to empathy, I really want you to know. What do you think it is? Yes, you got it. So here's what happens. This is the biggest gender difference between men and women. And I want to show you. I, Women, what does this mean? I ask men in my workshops before women answer. I, um, I always ask them, what does it mean when you're talking to someone like Donna and you know, if, if a, a woman tilts and nods her head? Generally, what does this mean if it's going slow? Okay, it typically means what? 
that I understand you. I understand. I get you. Tell me more about that. When you sit there and you nod, you're like, I get it. Um, by the way, when I ask most men what this means, what do you think it means? What do you think they tell me? They're like, oh, I'm in trouble. I'm like, this is why you're going to get divorced. That is not what it means, right? Okay. Because what, now it's different if they're doing this. Mm-hmm, okay. This is very different. Anyone that's doing it fast, what does it mean? It means hurry it up, speed it along, right? Which is why you're going to have people this week, it's human nature, you're going to be in this room all day in meetings. You'll have people that sit there and they nod quick or they'll move their feet like this and do stuff like this. What happens is I always say, take responsibility for your energy because how is that impacting the person you're talking to? How is it impacting the speaker on the stage? Is that you doing it back there? We're going to talk about it when I'm done, okay? So what happens is I would tell people is when you tilt and nod your head, this says, this is a very, um, from research, we, a lot of men typically don't do it. It's a very submissive gesture, but because we know that dominance and this looking confident, powerful is straight ahead. But what I tell people, I've had men that I've coached and they'll say, well, I'm not tilting and nodding my head. And I say, I don't care what you do because it's not about me. I'm never going to tell you how to show up. But you just sat here and told me at the very beginning of this workshop, there's a time to be powerful and confident, and then there's a time to be collaborative and empathetic. And in that moment, if you say you want to show up collaborative and empathetic, you would tilt your head and look at Don and say, wow, I'm sorry for doing that. I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to make you feel that way. And that comes across completely different and makes it safe. All right, give Donna some love. Thank you, Donna. All right, so I want to end with a couple things. Thank you. I want to end by doing like the next 10 minutes with this. I am a big believer after coaching so many thousands of people across this country, there is one trait above all other traits that will prevent you from connecting with people and it will prevent you, it will erode your credibility over time. So at your table, I want you all to agree on it. So I'm going to give you about a minute or two to say, if you could say above all traits, this one trait specifically will erode your ability to really connect and it will, it will eventually erode your credibility what do you think that number one trait is and share it at your table and why you believe that? All right, so let's talk about it. So I'm really, I'm really, I know I'm really passionate, but anyways, but I'm really passionate about this because I believe that this will erode, you as a leader, you can still be successful money-wise with it. But as a leader, I think it will completely erode your character, your credibility, and you will not be a great communicator when you, when you demonstrate this. So I'm going to start all the way. We're going to kind of go across. But over in the far thing, what, if there was only one trait above all other traits, what do you think it is? Okay, roll your, rolling your eyes. Okay, what else? Okay, so not listening. What else? Okay, arrogance. So being dishonest. What else? How many of you said dishonesty? A lot of people in the room typically say that. It's not the answer, but I think this is actually why people lie and are dishonest. And I'll show you in just a second. What else? So lack of trust, insincerity. On this side of the room, what do you think? Arrogance. Okay, so not being present. What else? Yeah, so they're incongruent when the words and body language don't match. Here's what I believe it is, and I think there's some research to back it up. It is what? It is ego. And I'm um, so... Oh, oh, yeah, we knew that, okay? okay. <laughs> so I want, in the last 10 minutes, I'm going to give you some, I'm going to tell you a couple quick things. One of the top leadership books in 2016 was by Ryan Holiday. It was on a lot of reading lists, and it was called Ego is the Enemy. And listen, as, an, as a coach, one thing I know is this. We all define words differently based on what we've experienced in our lives. So the moment I say intimacy to you, you define that word differently than I do based on our experiences. So when I say ego, you're defining that word probably very differently. So I want us to get on the same page. So Ryan Holiday actually defines the word ego as this unhealthy belief in your own importance. And so, because I want everyone to have authentic confidence, and to your point, to kind of stand up in your space no matter how tall you are and own your presence. But this unhealthy belief in your own importance will really get in people's way. So instead of me telling you about what it is, you all, I gotta tell you, I've done this workshop for a lot, for CEOs, I coach NCAA athletes all the way to teenagers. The same two people come up every time. So when you think about r famous people, leaders, pop culture, doesn't matter. When you think about people with really high ego, who do you think of? Okay, 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 she got real passionate about LeBron James over here, okay? It's good, who else? Okay, we always hear, so take politics out, I don't care. So they say Donald Trump and who in pop culture? 
Kanye West, it's the same people, all right? So what I'm gonna show you, I don't care who you think of that has high ego, but I want you to think of someone right now that you say, when I think of that person, that's the person that has really high ego. I'm gonna show you what he or she does. Now, let me say this, every one of us in this room has ego. So if you're sitting there going, well, this part don't apply to me, you're the one I worry about, okay? <laughs> okay? It's you, boo, okay? It's you, okay? So, so here's what I want you to know. I want you to know how it shows up. So think about Kanye West. Um, what, I always go back to that moment with Taylor Swift. We're still talking about that, I okay, am, okay? So watch what happens. What do those people do from, an, from their actions that make you believe they have high ego? What do they actually do? Okay, so they interrupt, condescending, what else? They, they, they tell you you're wrong. Everyone do this in this room. I want you to take one, take one hand and I want you to cover up one of your eyes, okay? And I want you to take your other hand and I want you to point to a dot or a spot on the wall or the ceiling that's not moving. So point to a stationary dot with your other hand, all right? Now, I want you to take your hand that's covering up your eye and let it down. And what happens to the spot? If you do it right, it should move, okay? <laughs> But what happens is, imagine that is kind of your truth. Look, you're still practicing. I love that, okay? Yeah, you know. So imagine that is your truth. Like, that is my dot, right? What people with high ego believe is that my truth is the only truth, and if you don't agree with it, you're an idiot, which is why people don't talk about politics, religion, spirituality, because my truth is the only truth, and if you don't agree with it, you're an idiot. Instead of saying, why can't we honor my truth, but I, at the same time, honor your truth as well? But people with high ego won't do that. And so what else will they not do? They believe, so I want you to write this down in, in, in the bottom left. So it's ego. We talk about what erodes credibility. It's ego. One thing is they believe their truth is the only truth. What else do they do? What do you think? Yeah, so, so sometimes, I guess, from, from maybe this bravado, this overconfidence, they'll, they'll kind of encompass your space and kind of get too close, and so there's no personal distance. What else will they do? Speak over you because they have to be heard. Um, in organizations, you probably work with people like this. W do they take accountability or not? They're not gonna take accountability and they're not gonna be open to feedback. And why is that? Because they believe that they are right. I'm gonna say this. Um, you know, in my 20s, I had a super high ego because I was really insecure with who I was. And what happened is I got into corporation and I started getting crazy results. And what happened is I put my self-worth in my job, in my career, and I kept getting rewarded for it. And I could even bully people in the organization, but as long as I got results, they kept giving me bonuses and accolades, and I kept moving up. And what I learned in organizationally is we, re we reward bad behavior when we don't hold people accountable to how they get results. And so, when, when that's why I'm so pat when I tell people take responsibility for your energy it is that behavior is unacceptable but when we don't talk to people in our organizations about how they show up and about how they're getting results we're rewarding the bad behavior and so th there's another way and so a couple things I want you to know when it comes to ego is these are the key points number one is it's always rooted in judgment and criticism watch this and you all we all have it because watch what happens if you were on the interstate coming here and someone maybe someone like cut you off to get off the exit really quick what, let's be honest, what's your go-to reaction sometimes when you got cut off? Let's be honest. Yeah, you might honk the horn, you'd be like, oh my gosh, you might flick them the bird, what else? And then, because what you do is you create a story. People with high ego create lots of stories because in your head you say, oh my God, I can't believe they just did that to who? To me, they don't know you, okay? Like, they don't. It was, it was, never, it was never about you, but you made it about you, right? And what happens is, Ego is always rooted in judgment and criticism. The moment, listen, in my 20s when I was sitting there, um, I would sit here because I felt really good as a speaker or a trainer. And imagine when I was really insecure inside, but I masked it with this big confidence and arrogance, I would be sitting right where you're sitting and a speaker would come up here and speak. And if I have really high ego in the audience, what do you think would be going through my head as this person started to speak? 
what is this young person going to teach me that I don't already know? Oh my gosh, I could do this so much better. And what I realize now as I'm 37 is that I spent so much time actually judging and criticizing people and I missed tons of opportunities to learn because I was too busy judging it. And that was my own ego. I got in my own way and I didn't take responsibility for my presence. The other thing is they ignore feedback. They don't take accountability. They're unaware of the impact they actually they leave on other people. So in their marriages, they are completely unaware of the relationships. They're unaware of how their behavior is actually impacting their ability to create trust and connection with their partner. And so they'll, they'll, they'll blow up or they'll do things. And then I always tell people this, taking responsibility for your energy doesn't mean you always get it right, right? It means that when we don't get it right, we slow down and we make it right. And I'll give you one final quick story. I was in Toronto airport. It was really early in the morning, years ago, and I had just gotten through customs and got through the little security thing, stepped in, and the TSA agent is checking the man's backpack in front of me, so, and then all these bins were lined up along the tray, so no one's back to come out. So I actually went, to, um, so she finishes, hand the man his backpack, and I go to slide all the trays down. And I don't know why, but when I, when I went to go slide all the trays down, the TSA agent goes like wham, and grabs the bins so I couldn't move any of them. And I like snapped up, like my head, like, oh, no, she did not, okay? <laughs> And you know, I'm from Kentucky and we can be, sometimes we can be passive aggressive and say, bless your heart. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, um, I'm like, well, so in my head, my ego kicked in without even thinking about it. And I was like, well, I'll show her. And what did I do? I took every bin, I stacked them on one another. I slid them down and I said, fine, I'll do your job for you. That didn't go so well, okay? <laughs> I do not recommend that to TSA, okay? <laughs> And I'll never forget, so we're yelling in the airport and I get my backpack, I take 15 steps down the terminal and I stopped because I teach this for a living. Take responsibility for your energy. And everything that I stand up here and teach, I did not represent myself. So I knew I had one of two options. I would either go back and apologize and own my part. I'm not responsible for her and her insecurity, but I'm responsible for how I delivered my message. Or I would just go around the rest of my day and I know how I am, I would obsess about it and be like, I shouldn't have done that, blah, 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 blah. All right, so I decide to go back, y'all. Okay, y'all like that, y'all? So I decide to go back. So I'm making my way back to her, thinking, I got this, it's gonna be okay. So I get up to her. It's not going to be okay, okay? So, so I go up to her, and she's turned around, and I go, excuse me, ma'am, and I'm not being dramatic. She goes, what? And I said, I need to tell you I'm sorry. You did not deserve the way that I talked to you, and I feel like I owe you an apology. And she says to me, well, I don't accept your apology. <laughs> had I not had it together at that point, right? This is where emotional intelligence kicks in. Had I not had it together, what would I have done? I would have karate chopped her in her esophagus, okay? I would have, okay? I would have. So what happened is at that point, I had it together and I told her, I said, ma'am, I go, you don't have to accept my apology, but I still feel like I owe that to you. And you all, I, she got me good. Listen, I said to her, I got my stuff and I said, I hope you have a good day. Without even blinking, she goes, well, I hope you have a bad one and walks away. <laughs> Who does that, okay? okay? But I'm not gonna own that for her, right? That's on her. That's her energy, that's not my energy. And so I do wanna leave you with a few things. Can you be super successful money-wise and, and, and have high ego? Oh, yeah. Yes, but I'm gonna tell you, when I, when I, when I coach leaders, usually in the, when I start these workshops, I'll say, I want you to think about the leader you really admire in your career. And if I asked you right now to think about that one person that you really admire, no one's gonna think about the person that had ego, that thought about themselves, that was arrogant, that was condescending, no one. So when you think about your legacy, that is not gonna be, your, that person will not be the person that anyone in this room thinks about. And so you've gotta get clear about how you wanna show up. What do you want your legacy, legacy to be? And so I want you to do a few things as we leave here. So I got two minutes, I wanna tell you the takeaways. So number one is I want you just to take responsibility for your energy every day, especially in this conference. So today, when I, I don't know who's going after me, I, good luck, because you're gonna be like, point your feet, open up, okay, do all this, all right? All right? But what I would say is, as you're speaking, I just want you to show up for the people at your table. When someone's talking, are you on your phone? Are you, kinda, are, you, are you facing away? Or do you show up and say, when I coach people, sometimes I do check out and I have to tell myself, I owe it to Tina to show up for Tina right now. I owe it to her. And if I can't, I'm gonna go outside and get on my phone and take care of my emails or go make a phone call. That's okay, but just go be fully present in your life and then be fully present for the people in this room when you come back in. Number two, 
is I always tell people, you have to learn to see yourself inside the conversation. So if, when you're talking right now at your table this week, or you know, the next today, imagine yourself, if you could see above yourself and you were looking down at how you're showing up, would you be proud of that? Would people be like, you know what? She created trust, she created connection. Someone might not talk at your table. And do you have the willingness and the courage to look over and say, hey, is everything okay? I know you haven't contributed. I wanna hear what you have to say because it's really, it matters to me. Like, do we just go out of our way and do that for people? And the last thing is this understanding how to just flex your style when it's appropriate. You do not always have to show up as confident and powerful, but, and there's a time to be collaborative and empathetic. And do you know how to really do that? So, a couple things I wanna leave you with. On the bottom of my website, on the homepage, justinpatton.com, if I try to send out a weekly really short newsletter to people around some type of leadership or communication topic. I try to keep it about two minutes or under so it's really short. So if you wanna sign up for there, it's also there's a text message, you can do it on the text message on the handout I gave you. And I wanna leave you with these final two things. I love this quote. Leo Tolstoy said, everyone thinks about changing the world but not a lot of people think about changing themselves. And I hope when you leave here that you will give yourself permission just to say, you know what? I have one or two things that I can do to probably show up different. And I wanna end with this. The lady, the lady that I teach with at Taco Bell, she's an amazing woman, her name is Sandra. And she goes, one of the hardest lessons I've ever learned as a career woman, as a mom, is to, give, is to give myself permission to burn the superwoman cape that I try to wear every day. And she goes, what I, and, and, what, and here's how I'm gonna apply that. You know, I, um, there was another woman in that Taco Bell um, conference that I did. She came up to me. She had just had her first granddaughter. And she goes, you know what I've realized now? She goes, I gave my children, I, did, I worked so hard to give them everything that I did not have. And what I realize now is I gave them everything but me. And all they wanted all along was me. And so sometimes I think we put on these superhero capes or you as women leaders put on superhero capes and you had to do all these things for everyone. And I just wanna leave you with this. You don't have to do anything besides just show up. Your presence alone makes you a champion for other people. And please give yourself permission this week to kind of burn that superwoman cape, put it away, and just be fully present for the people in your life. I'm a big believer. No one says they believe in people enough. So if no one tells you they believe in you, I believe in you. And I hope you have a great conference. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Wanda Peter Fesso with Centerpoint Energy from Houston and uh, just finished the conference with Justin Patton, which was fabulous. Um, he gave us a lot of information and practical application for the things we do that impact our presence uh, and, and our being there for other people. And I will take back um, several things um, that I'll use, of course, for myself and share with other people. So. Great job, Justin. Thank you very much. Hi, my name's Anne. Uh, I work with the Silver Spring Networks. Um, this is my first time at the Energetic Women's Conference. Um, and uh, I had a great experience learning about what Justin has to say about power and uh, importance and how they can make you more confident as well as kill your presence um, as a leader. So I, I really enjoy the, the tips that he give around how ego is the number one thing that can kill your connection with people. Um, and that really hit me personally because uh, I recently went through um, a personal experience that really helped me understand what that means uh, with your friends, significant others, family, as well as uh, coworkers. So that was uh, my favorite part about it. I thought Justin's presentation was outstanding as um, a growing leader and someone who's continu continually trying to improve my own skills. He made me think a lot about not only you know, how I'm perceived as a leader, but how I can help encourage and help my team grow. I agree. I thought Justin was very motivational, very, um, very perceptive, and made me, made me think a lot. And, and he was very captivating. Phenomenal speaker. Yeah. I highly recommend it.